Tonight on Primetime Politics, trying to end the Liberal filibuster. We need to know exactly what she knew and what the Prime Minister knew. Only she can answer these questions. But Pierre Polyev introduces a motion that would start a new study on foreign interference and call on the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff to testify. Is the Conservative leader jeopardizing faith in Canadian democracy for political gain? Is the Prime Minister by not turning the whole matter to a public inquiry? Also, President Xi goes to Moscow. How will the state visit of the Chinese leader affect the war in Ukraine? And banking turmoil. With the bailout of Credit Suisse and the sudden collapses of two banks in the United States, do Canadians need to be worried about the road ahead? This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. Katie Telford is the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and her name was heard several times today during question period, the subject of conservative questions as the party introduced a motion that would start a new inquiry into foreign interference and would call on Telford to testify. Conservatives have been wanting that but a Liberal filibuster has prevented it so far. We know now from leaked intelligence reports that the Liberal Party received help in multiple elections from the communist government in Beijing, which wanted to keep the prime minister in place. We know that his top campaign officials like Katie Telford would have been aware of this help. And we need to know exactly what she knew and what the prime minister knew. Only she can answer these questions. Now, MPs will vote on the Conservative motion tomorrow. But joining us right now are Mark Gerritsen. He's the Liberal MP for Kingston and the Islands in Ontario. He's also the Parliamentary Secretary for the Government House Leader. Michael Cooper is the Conservative MP for St. Albert Edmonton. He's also a member of the Common Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs. And Peter Julian is the NDP House Leader and the MP for New Westminster Burnaby in British Columbia. Hello to all three of you. Hello. Good, good to be here. Good to be here. Uh, Mr. Garrison, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, the Conservative leader is very clear. He thinks that Katie Telford has information pertinent to the investigation on foreign interference. She has testified in public before. Why not now on such an important matter? Well, I think it's uh, important just to reflect on Mr. Polyev's comments himself. Back in 2010, he himself said that, um, you know, bringing staff before committee is not uh, the appropriate uh, uh, um, thing to do. Ministers are ultimately accountable, not staff uh, individuals. And in 2010, uh, Prime Minister Harper sent John Baird to a committee um, when uh, the committee had re requested staff go, So, who was a minister at the time. So I think it's important to reflect on the fact that, um, you, know, uh, you know, just look at what Mr. Polyev himself has said, which is that um, it's not appropriate. And I think that a lot of people agree with that. Mr. Julian himself even actually just said that in committee uh, recently, which is right. At the end of the day, the buck stops with the minister. It's up to the minister uh, to be answering questions. Uh, the minister is the one that's responsible, uh, and we should be keeping that um, several hundred year old uh, tradition intact. Uh, Mr. Cooper, how do you respond to that? Given the, the track record of Mr. Polyev while he was in opposition, why in this case should Katie Telfer, Saffer, actually testify? This is just another example of the Liberals doing anything to deflect from the issue at hand, talking about Mr. Polyev's statements from 10 or 13 years ago on a different issue in a different context but didn't involve the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. Katie Telford is more than just a staff member. She is the Prime Minister's top political advisor. She is arguably the second most powerful person in government of the Prime Minister and she is a critical witness to get to the bottom of the heart of the scandal and that is what does the Prime Minister know when did he know about it? And what did he do or fail to do with respect to Beijing's election interference? And not one, but two elections under his watch as prime minister. It's also important to note that Katie Telford was intricately involved in the Liberal Party campaigns of 2019 and 2021. Uh,
both campaigns have a lot to answer for in terms of some of the allegations uh, around foreign interference. So it's absolutely imperative that Katie Telford uh, appear. And the fact that the liberals have spent almost 24 hours at Prague filibustering my straightforward motion to bring her to committee raises the question, what does Katie Telford know that the Prime Minister wants to hide from Canadians? Uh, Mr. Julian, Mr. Gerritsen uh, quoted you to us, but I'll get you to speak for yourself. Given what we're hearing from Mr. Cooper, do you think it is important to hear from the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff? Well, first off, our, our priority, and the NDP's priority, is to put in place a public inquiry. We believe that needs to be independent and transparent. We steered that motion through PROC. Tomorrow, the NDP will be moving that motion as a concurrence motion. And we are hoping that all MPs uh, uh, vote yes on the motion for a public inquiry to send that unmistakable message to the Prime Minister. The, the reality is, uh, at the committee level, uh, it doesn't have the same effectiveness as having the public inquiry. And that's uh, the NDP being the adults in the room yet again, and the member from Burnaby South, Jagmeet Singh, uh, proposing that public inquiry. Uh, we believe that, that that is the way to look at, in a comprehensive way, at the foreign interference. Yes, the Chinese example, but also the Russian example that was, uh, as uh, the National Observer exposed, uh, related to the convoy takeover of Ottawa and other governments like Iran as well. These are all things that need to be covered by a public inquiry, and we're going to continue to press uh, the government to put that into place. Okay, but if you want a public inquiry, and of course you're not the only opposition party that's calling for this, why not support uh, I guess what you could call an interim step to get Katie Telford to testify to, to, to gain some greater transparency. Uh, well, you, you'll recall a, a couple weeks ago, I actually moved a motion to that effect in procedure in House Affairs, and the Conservatives then blocked it and messed with it. Uh, and then ultimately, in terms of the public inquiry, which called for both Katie Telford and also Jenny Burns, uh, the campaign manager for Pierre Polyev to come forward, and the Conservatives, in fact, uh, Mr. Cooper, amended it to take that out of the public inquiry call. So th there's a, a lot of political games being played. I think the reality is, fundamentally, we need to look at what is in the best interest of Canada. That is clearly a public inquiry, and the NDP is going to be dogged and determined to get that done. And, and let me just say that that I supported, Conservatives supported as a friendly amendment, an amendment to my motion to include uh, Jenny Byrne on the list of witnesses to appear before PROC. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, we support a public inquiry. Pierre Polyev has been very clear about that, and we will be supporting the NDP concurrence motion. But the real issue at hand is what is the NDP going to do about Katie Telford? The NDP blocked Katie Telford from appearing before PROC on three occasions. Uh, you, the real, you, if, the if, real if, test if, is... If, if I can... You stripped her out sure. of the public Peter, inquiry. The real, the real, Peter, 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 respectfully, you the test... The you test, stripped it out. Well, tomorrow you, is... You move the amendment to strip it out. Are you going to vote for if, or against the motion? The if I can jump in here just for a second. I think it's... I think that what Mr. Julian is talking about is actually the right direction. Why are the Conservatives so focused on just China? When you think about it today, the president of Russia and the president of, of China are meeting to talk about, um, you know, moving forward and what the future looks like. We know that foreign interference is not just coming from China. We have, we know that foreign interference is something that uh, Russia is interested in, something that Iran's interested in, something that China's interested in. Why are the conservatives just focused on China? So I actually agree with Mr. Julian when he talks about broadening the scope of what we do and what is being looked at specifically. The the only issue that I have with the NDP's position is the venue in which you do it. Um, they're very adamant about a public inquiry. I tend to think that, you know, listening to our security experts who suggest that the better place for this is within the institutions that we already have that are tasked to deal with this. Um, and so, but I, but I, I do appreciate uh, where Mr. Julian's coming from when he says we need to start looking at all of this. But the Conservatives seem, seem very interested in only talking about China, and one can only wonder why. Uh, I well, Mr. Clear. Cooper, let me let me jump in very quickly, Mr. Cooper. You, you know, we, we heard Mr. Julian reference political games, and the Prime Minister does accuse your party of playing politics and undermining faith in democratic institutions. There are processes underway to investigate the issue, as the Liberal House uh, leader puts it, with deep seriousness. Is your party just trying to score political points here? We supported the NDP mo amendment to my motion 
to have a public inquiry that is broad in scope, and we will support the concurrence motion tomorrow. But what is at issue are very specific reports of interference by Beijing in two elections, a vast campaign of interference, uh, and we need to get to the bottom of what the Prime Minister knew, when he knew about it, and why he failed to act. That is the heart of the issue, and in order to get that answer, we need to have Katie Telford appear before committee. Now, they, the Liberals have something to hide. They've been filibustering for more than 24 hours. The question is for the NDP, and they, they'll get to make a choice and answer that question tomorrow. Are they going to support our motion for transparency to get answers about Beijing's interference, to have Katie Telford appear before PROC, before the Ethics Committee, or are they going to continue to do the bidding I, I of this corrupt liberal government. I think it's very rich for Mr. Uh, Cooper to be sitting next to me talking about a government in Canada that is corrupt, talking about uh, having something truth, to hide, the truth, when the, the truth, reality the of the situation is, is that this government has done more regarding foreign interference than any than, than any other government, and indeed, Stephen Harper did absolutely nothing. We've set up ENSICOP with the tools for parliamentary oversight. We've set up a special panel to review elections real time and respond to the threats in real time. We brought in legislation, Bill C-76, that the Conservatives voted against that specifically tightens up the rules around fundraising and foreign interference. We've closed multiple different loopholes. We've worked uh, for seven or eight years on this issue specifically. So to somehow come in here and say that, you, you know, Know, we're not doing anything and we haven't done enough, I think is incredibly that, rich. That the Liberals have not done a public inquiry. That's what Jagmeet Singh has called for. That's what John pierre Kingsley, the former head of Elections Canada, has called for. And a variety of people who've been involved in the security establishment, they all believe a public inquiry is warranted and necessary. And this, for the life of me, I, I don't understand uh, the stonewalling by the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister on something that just strikes a chord of good common sense for so many Canadians. They want to make sure that our election system is preserved and protected, that we are free of foreign interference. We have a number of egregious examples of Chinese interference, of Russian interference, and we need the public inquiry to get answers for Canadians and clear the air. And, and but Mr. Julian, Canadian. sorry, Mr. Cooper, yeah. but Mr. Julian, again, and Mr. Cooper has made the point though, if you want to get to closer to the truth, why not support the motion when it's, uh, when it's up for a vote in the House tomorrow? Will you support the Conservative motion tomorrow? Again, the Conservatives have been all over the map. They took out the motion that called for a public inquiry, called for Katie Telford and Jenny Burns to testify. They stripped that out. Mr. Cooper stripped that out of the motion that the NDP will be presenting tomorrow on the public inquiry. Uh, so they've been all over the map on these but things. But in terms of the Conservative it's motion introduced in the House today, will your party be supporting it? It, this is not the motion that the NDP would be presenting. This is not the motion that the NDP uh, is putting forward in the House tomorrow. And so what we've said very, very clearly is a public inquiry is warranted and necessary, and we're hoping that the government sees that very quickly. Okay, uh, quickly losing time, but I know, Mr. Cooper, you want to get in there very quickly. Well, very simply, uh, if Mr. Julian is committed to getting to the truth, then he would support the motion. We're not opposed oh. to the concurrence motion. We're open to friendly amendments to but our motion from the NDP, Katie but the key question, the NDP motion. The key question is that Katie you, Telford, the moved the motion she countless to strip knows the truth. Former MPs, she, pardon me, I, 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 she former knows the truth and it's up to the NDP. They can be the part of the cover-up coalition. One day will do that, cover -up and then the next day they will strip out they the... they can join us in getting <laughs> answers for Canadians to get to the bottom of It's very difficult to follow the Conservatives as they were through coalition. this very, very strange, up uh, very strange route that the can't Conservatives answer, take, where one day they're in favor, the next day they're opposed. It's very strange, uh, difficult well, to follow. The, the coalition well, we, at work covering well, up. Well, we will be watching the we will be watching the vote on the motion tomorrow, coalition. gentlemen. We're out of time. Would actually tell you what the difference Mr. is between Julian, and supply and coalition. Mr. Julian, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Gerritsen, thank you for this. We're watching the vote tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Meanwhile, to Moscow now, where Xi Jinping met face to face today with Vladimir Putin, the Chinese leader on a state visit to Russia, declaring the two countries good neighbors and good partners as the Kremlin continues its illegal invasion of Ukraine. Here is how the deputy prime minister reacted to the visit. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the strongest challenge in a generation to the rules-based international order. And that rules-based international order is something all the countries of the world depend on. So I'm not going to anticipate what President Xi will say or do in Moscow, but China and China's leadership needs to understand the stakes here and needs to understand that Vladimir Putin is on the wrong side of history. To discuss President Xi's state visit to Russia, we're now joined by Stephanie Carvin. She is an associate professor of international relations at Carleton University, also a former national security analyst. Stephanie, always good to see you. Hey, thanks for having me on. You know, in different times, this visit might not be getting the attention that it's getting right now. But given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, talk to us about the significance here. How significant is this visual cue from Xi that he's willing to be hosted by Putin in, in Moscow? So I think there's a number of things that give this kind of a unique context. The first is that, of course, um, Vladimir Putin was declared to be or indicted as a war criminal by the International Criminal Court, and President Xi is the first uh, leader to visit um, uh, Putin and, you know, wasn't shy about it, right? Uh, arrived on a big plane, made a big show of it. Um, so even though this trip was planned before that indictment, um, we're definitely seeing uh, a, a, the, the fact that this is not something that bothers Mr. Xi. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's also sending a message to the West in the sense that, you know, uh, there is alternate ways for the globe to order itself. And definitely President Xi has kind of been on something of a diplomatic mission recently with regards to the Middle East, where he's uh, seems to have been able to get Saudi Arabia and Iran to reestablish diplomatic relations. And um, he's been put forward a peace plan, right? So I think there's a lot of kind of image bolstering here. Um, China has been under pressure uh, and maybe feeling a bit surrounded in the Indo-Pacific area. And this is a way for uh, him to assert China on the global stage, uh, regardless of what the West or the International Criminal Court thinks. Well, talk to us about China's potential engagement with Russia here. How might that affect the war in Ukraine? Are we talking about arms, financing, trade? How might China actually be of aid to Russia right now? In all kinds of ways. And in fact, China right now is a lifeline to Russia, right? Uh, in terms of finance, um, I believe trade was up between the two countries by 30% as, uh, you know, Western sanctions took hold uh, of Russia and they couldn't import many of the things they'd been importing before. Uh, China's financial system uh, continues to collect, uh, sorry, connect Russia to world markets in some ways. And we also know that there's been some, you know, all, all, despite all these sanctions, that, uh, you know, Russia has found ways to import Chinese semiconductors, you know, things that are components that are very important for building things like missiles um, in, in kind of covert ways. So, you no, know, Russia's, all, uh, sorry, China has already been a lifeline for Russia in many ways. And there's no doubt in my mind that what uh, Putin would like is that for some of this non-lethal aid to perhaps turn into lethal aid. The one thing that Russia is really, really missing right now is art artillery um, and missiles, and that it's looking everywhere it can to to try and, and, and bring this forward. So I imagine that was something that was discussed in the apparently 4.5 hour long meeting that President Xi and Putin had. Okay, but but don't China and Russia already have competing interests in Central Asia? They do, but I think to a certain extent, um, I don't know if it's an agree to disagree kind of situation, but the priority for Russia right now, without a doubt, is is Ukraine. And yes, China is moving into some of these, um, you know, Caucasus regions uh, in areas like Kazakhstan and, and places like that. So um, there is competing interest. I mean, it was, you know, I think what, the 60, 70 years ago, they, they've actually fought a war against each other. Um, and so, you know, we, we but but at the same time, um, you know, I think President Xi is, you know, sees China as overall benefiting 
from the situation in Ukraine, right? Um, he now basically has Russia as a client state. Uh, it's giving China an ability to put its own peace plan forward so it looks good. Um, it kind of is representing uh, opposition to the West while trying to basically say that, hey, look, we're, we're, we're against uh, what they call the Ukraine crisis. They don't call it the war um, as well, but we want to try and um, find some kind of uh, solution to it. So I think that um, even though there is competition, you know, in February of 2022, right before this invasion happened, both countries pledged to each other friendship without limits. And President Xi seems to be living up to that. And in fact, with this trip is doubling down on it, despite all of the criticism of Russia over the last year. Okay, I, I've got less than a minute here, but, but I do want to ask you because China's relationship with the West certainly at a, a low right now. How far can uh, President Xi actually go without permanently damaging for or at least for, for a long time, that relationship with the West? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think it wasn't so long ago that we were talking about Balloon Gate, right? This balloon that had flown over uh, the United States. And that disrupted some of the plans I think President Xi had to perhaps try and find ways of working with the Biden administration because they effectively cut their, uh, you know, decided not to have meetings with China. Um, I don't know. I think uh, China may have realized that as far as the West goes, that, you know, this the ship has largely sailed and it's going to have to find its own path in the world. And that's going to be working with countries in Africa, um, you know, in parts of Asia, Russia, and what, you know, traditionally was the non-aligned world. So this is a part of that, I think, of Xi trying to make a big splash on the global stage in recent months after his uh, unprecedented third term in um, power. Stephanie, always really great to have your insight. Thank you for this. Thank you. Humanity is on thin ice. Those are the words of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres today, reacting to the latest report from the UN Climate Panel. That expert body now saying international emissions need to fall by 60% by the year 2035 if countries want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That is the target set out in the 2015 Paris Agreement. But at the current rate, the world will blow past that target by the start of the next decade. Still, the UN expert panel and environmentalists say there is hope. We are at the beginning of a new era where we will be less and less dependent on fossil fuels. We will be using more clean technologies, more renewable energy. But the question is, how fast can we collectively deploy those measures to keep temperature increases as far as possible below 2 degrees Celsius and as much as possible around 1.5 degrees Celsius as per the Paris Agreement How requires us to do. The world has already warmed 1.1 degrees Celsius since Paris and experts warn of far more extreme weather if the international community fails to act. Well, let's turn now to the global banking crisis and the news that Credit Suisse is being taken over by Switzerland's largest bank, UBS. Now, this move is a hastily brokered deal. It was brought about by government pressure, and it follows the collapse of two banks in the United States earlier this month. It might be easy to say those events did not happen here in Canada, but will they actually have a ripple effect on this country? To talk about this, we're now joined by the chief economist for the Conference Board of Canada, Pedro Antunes. Pedro, Nice seeing you again. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Listen, I, I, a lot to talk about here, but, uh, but I want to set the stage, if you will, right off top, because Credit Suisse was considered one of the most influential, important banks in the world. How could this happen? Well, I, I think we were all a little bit surprised about what's uh, developed over the last few days uh, in the banking world. Um, but certainly, I think there were signs that Credit Suisse, for those that were watching that company carefully, uh, signs that things weren't going well, had been involved in some fraud, had been involved in tax evasion. Uh, we know that uh, it had suffered losses year after year. Uh, and in fact, its share values had been declining uh, since at least 2022, quite precipitously. So, um, you know, I, I think what's what's common about what's happened to the three or four banks that have been affected is that there's a lot more scrutiny now that one 
one has failed. Uh, you know, the kind of social me media driven scrutiny has is, is, uh, uh, grown and really no bank uh, can can suffer a, a bank run if there uh, starts to be concern, a loss of confidence. So I think that's what's common for all of the banks that we've seen uh, troubled. But uh, Credit Suisse, I think, came in with a lot of problems prior to uh, interest rate increases or any other uh, any of the other issues that we've seen uh, affecting the banking sector. Now, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the central bank, and of course, the central bank in this country, along with the U.S. Fed and the central banks of uh, England, Japan, the EU, Switzerland, they, they announced a joint move to, to, to guarantee liquidity in the market. And this has uh, something to do with li liquidity swap arrangements. Talk to us about how that works and how it would theoretically provide greater confidence in the system right now. Well, I, I think this is a, essentially an arrangement among the central banks, as you've mentioned. I think we saw some of that happening or starting to happen, uh, certainly uh, um, during the financial crisis, 2008 and nine. Uh, and the arrangements that were in place are now kind of being uh, pushed forward. We're seeing more money injected or potentially injected into the into the system, into the swaps. But the swaps really are the essentially an interbank, uh, intercentral bank line of credit. Um, and that's if, you know, there's pressure on any one central bank. The other central banks have essentially a backstop to, to fill in uh, should there be a need. It, it really is another gesture to try and rebuild confidence in the system. You know, banks are built on confidence. No bank, uh, no individual bank can suffer a, a bank run without failing, essentially, because they just don't have all of the assets liquid to be able to pay back depositors. So what they need to have is confidence that they are able to pay back depositors depositors so that no, there's no rush like this. Um, and that's what they're essentially we're trying to build here, what central banks are trying to build, uh, you know, with this with this move. OK, so so if it's about building confidence, do Canadians need to be worried right now by by all this financial turmoil? Will this become another 2008 financial crisis? Well, as you may recall, in 2008, 2009, we chartered banks here in Canada that did actually quite well compared to most banks globally. Um, and that is because we're, I think, a little more prudent, certainly in, in terms of taking on mortgage-backed back securities. or very little of that happening in uh, in the big Canadian banks. Uh, and the fact that we do have uh, you know, a smaller number of banks, big banks, uh, but a smaller number. If you compare to the U.S., if you add up the kind of national and regional banks, there's close to 4,000 banks in the U.S. here in Canada. That we're much more limited. So in some ways, less competition, but in other ways, you know, the, these banks are bigger, they're more secure. Uh, they tend to be, uh, you know, a lot of the deposits are insured, backstopped. Uh, you know, we have our regulator uh, doing stress or demanding stress tests from the central banks. So, excuse me, from the chartered banks uh, so that we know that they can withstand, you know, uh, you know a lot of stress. Uh, and so there's, I think, nothing really to suggest that there's going to be any problems for any of the big banks in Canada from this. Um, you know, I think the, the impacts will more so be indirect on the economy should we start to see, you know, essentially problems of confidence uh, in terms of driving economic activity globally. And, you know, if uh, we see the U.S. Uh, uh, or uh, the global economy in, in in more trouble than it already is because, you know, we're heading to, into a very weak 2023, uh, then obviously this would play itself out in, in, in terms of our own trade and our own economic performance. Well, then quickly losing time, but I have to ask you then, if you if that's the commercial banks, what about the central bank? Will what's happening right right now give the Bank of Canada any kind of pause if they're thinking of raising interest rates again? Yeah, I think in Canada, we were already um, uh, pretty certain that uh, we were going to see a pause, assuming inflation keeps going in the right direction. We'll see tomorrow if that's the, tr if that's the case for February. Uh, but more so for the U.S., I think uh, just prior to these kind of hiccups in the banking sector, we'd heard uh, Jerome Powell talking about potentially increasing rates even further to really press the brakes on inflation. Uh, he may he may uh, take a pause on that. And in fact, now we're hearing a little bit more about potentially seeing lower rates, uh, perhaps even later this year. So uh, I do think this has stressed the system, adds uncertainty, it's taken wealth out of equity markets. Uh, you know, it uh, it is another, how should I say, another break on the economy, if you'd like, that's doing the job here. Pedro, really appreciate the time today. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And that is our program for this Monday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow.